Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video. Today on the channel we have Coach Mark Carroll, or Carroll, not sure how to pronounce it, I think maybe Carroll, doesn't matter, 200,000 training programs sold, world champion bikini coach. So let's go ahead and just see whether this person is a meathead or not by watching this video, which is a reaction video because that's what gets the most clicks these days. Who would ever do reaction videos? Let's just see what he has to say. It has to do with thermodynamics. And let's just jump right into this video. Uh... Okay, so let's see if he has any understanding of that. But first, before we get into this video, please subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already to gain access to one week early uploads, ad-free content, uncensored content, and one extra video per week. Link in the description below. And also, buy my book Contraindicated if you haven't already as well. Also linked in the description. And with that being said, this is a video that he's reacting to, and the text on this video says, POV, what you think burns more fat? Purposely misleading posts like these. I hate purposely misleading posts as well. I absolutely cannot stand it. I also don't like accidentally misleading posts, let's say, without malice aforethought. I hate them. I really do, because I can't stand arrogant ignorance. What you think burns more fat? Running? No! What actually burns more fat? Walking on an inclined treadmill? Ugh. Honestly, I don't think it's really gonna give that much change. Perhaps the incline, because you are training muscle fibers to be more glycolytic, and the way that that affects your physiology, as compared to steady state, moderate intensity jogging like we saw in the beginning, is much more optimal for effectuating fat loss. But I don't think people should be doing anything that she just did, actually. After me, the fuel source you use for your cardio does not matter for burning more Body fat. I'm not sure what you are implying there. Are you talking about the energy that is used in your mitochondria, as in glucose versus fat? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Aerobic cardio like this. Okay, there's no such thing as anaerobic exercise. Please subscribe to my Patreon to check out a Patreon exclusive upload wherein I actually talk about that in extensive detail because there is no such thing as anaerobic exercise. There are two anaerobic systems and there is an aerobic system, but they're all working simultaneously necessarily at all times, no matter whether you are engaging in volitional exercise to exhaustion or sitting in a chair like I am. Okay be more glycolytic so you're going to use carbohydrates as fuel okay this is why people should be watching this video that i uploaded because the notion is that anaerobic exercise uses more carbohydrates as fuel because it depends on more glycogen because glycogenolysis is used in exercise to twitch a muscle fiber when you engage in aerobic exercise all exercise is aerobic but when you engage in things that are colloquially deemed aerobic exercise like walking like light jogging you're training your muscle fibers to be less glycolytic and more dependent on oxidative produced ATP or energy really is what I should say because PCR brings the energy to the side as well. Here's the thing. The body during anaerobic exercise is oxidizing fatty acids in the mitochondria so it's using fat and it's also breaking down glycogen to perform muscle twitching. It's breaking down glycogen and fat so it's breaking down carbohydrates and fat. That's not how this works. The body will typically depend in a ketogenic state as well on gluconeogenically produced glucose through the breakdown of triglycerides into glycerol. So if anything in a ketogenic state you'd be oxidizing more fat during anaerobic exercise because you have not consumed carbohydrates to serve the glucose needs for glycogen resynthesis. But anyway, you are burning fat and glucose in anaerobic exercise. And also, in aerobic exercise, you're really primarily oxidizing, well, probably glucose in someone that's not ketogenic. Depends on who you are. You're oxidizing more fatty acids and ketones if you are ketogenic during aerobic exercise. But anyway. Whereas, lower intensity cardio is aerobic and going to all exercise is aerobic okay so you've already evinced your misunderstanding of human physiology right here right here in exercise physiology coach mark well fat is fuel but this doesn't fucking matter this is my well that actually does matter because that changes your physiology you do realize that the oxidation of fatty acids within the mitochondria produces vastly more atp than the oxidation of glucose molecules you do realize that right 129 net atp from one fatty acid chain that is 16 carbon chains long so palmitic acid really versus 38 net atp from one glucose molecule if it goes to the transition stage and then oxidative phosphorylation okay that's 339 percent more atp that does change things it changes the rate at which a carbohydrate dependent athlete can maintain their stamina the length of time at which they can maintain their stamina because those people are depending on glucose for oxidative phosphorylation oxidatively produced energy for glycogen resynthesis rather than fat so it uses up their glucose more than it would in a ketogenic person and once they're out of that glucose their bodies are not adept at creating glucose through the liver and, and the kidneys through gluconeogenesis which is precisely why people that are athletes that want to transition to a ketogenic diet must unequivocally expect a dip in performance for months before they get better. And that's typically what happens. They get better in terms of performance. Favorite part. 
Here she says, calories in and calories out is the old school thing. Get well, unfortunately, it's not old school. It is still a mainstream idea, a fallacious idea. It's basic physics as to why it is fallacious. Basic physics. The times. Uh, uh, what the hell? And here below, she's saying, no, being on a deficit just burns calories, which includes muscle loss but doesn't target more fat. What the hell? Okay, she's wrong here too. Actually, being on a deficit just burns calories. How do you burn something that is the result of burning something? Can't oxidize a calorie because calorie has no mass. Calories have no mass and therefore cannot affect the mass balance of the human body up or down by any means. Okay, so just absolutely incorrect. Muscle loss is the result of things like chronically elevated cortisol, which will waste away muscle by breaking down amino acids for glucose. It'll raise your propensity for storing onto fat as well. Muscle wasting can also occur from a lack of adequate nutrition to maintain musculature and muscle growth, etc., etc. It has nothing to do really with a deficit of food per se, unless the deficit of food, that being a mass deficit, does not provide adequate nutrient intake for muscle synthesis. So, anyway. You want to know how you can burn more fat? Okay, by burn more fat, you mean oxidize more fat. If you want to effectuate such a thing and manifest that in your body, what you'd want to do is get your insulin lower in terms of its homeostatic level and spike it as seldomly as possible. How do you do that? You abstain from carbohydrate consumption. You eat a species-appropriate, species-specific diet, that being a 100% carnivorous diet consisting of the flesh and associated fat of large ruminant animals primarily, as inferred and unequivocally established by stable nitrogen and carbon isotope analyses conducted on the collagen of the long bones of ancient human remains that have established established that 80% of our effective fuel intake came from large ruminant animals, and the other 20% came from large fibrous tubers, which inferentially speaking was the result of unsuccessful hunts and or food scarcity. Other sciences point in opposite directions in terms of that fibrous consumption, so that's why we don't eat the other 20%, we just eat the 100%. No carbohydrates to speak of whatsoever, because carbohydrates exogenously speaking are contraindicated for human consumption, glucose in particular being the prototypical one, is a 6-carbon aldehyde, and in a high enough concentration destroys lipid rafts, tears cell membranes to pieces, binds to DNA by causing mutations to it, and in high enough concentration, but still relatively low, kills cells outright. Does this through a process called glycation, which involves the fusing of a glucose molecule to other proteins within the body through covalent mechanisms, and causes them to, well, work improperly or not work at all, launching inflammation. But also, stimulating a vast insulin spike, which is an anabolic hormone involved in not only muscle protein synthesis, but also, most importantly and most relevant to this context, the storing of triglycerides in adipose tissue or muscle cells for quick and ready fuel. So anyway, are we done here? That's how you can burn more fat. You cause the body to get into a catabolic state, the state that we existed in for 99% of our existence as a species, to produce ketones and produce fatty acids and glycerol through the breakdown of triglycerides. There you go. Also exercise, added musculature will increase metabolic rate at rest. So that'll help as well. You know, if you do keto and eat high fat, you'll burn more fat because you eat more fat. Well, it sounds like you actually got that right. Because fat doesn't touch your insulin, really. You have to eat a lot of fat for it to start to initiate an insulin response. But anyway. If you do low fat and high carb, you'll burn less fat because you're eating more carbohydrates and less fats. But yes, typically that's the case. Of course, if you vastly restrict your mass of food intake, vastly, that's the only way that the whole calories model works, is if you vastly restrict your food intake, then of course, mass has to come from somewhere, so you'll be losing fat on your body, of course, sure. But typically, yes, if you maintain the same volume of food, but you replace the macronutrient makeup and make it more carbohydrate dominant, then yeah, that's what's gonna happen, because we know how this works on a biochemical basis. And this doesn't dictate if you lose body fat. That, yes it does, you just said it does. Yes it does. Statements like this, as a trainer for 18 years. Well, I don't care how long you've been a trainer. Nobody cares. Nobody sensible cares. I don't care if you've been a trainer for 60 years. Doesn't mean you're right about everything you say. This just kills my soul. It's Nobody cares. Just so much bad information out there. Saying, yeah, I agree. And I really hope that you are not someone that is going to promulgate some. Calories in, calories out is old school. Like, oh my God. No, it's thermodynamics. Oh boy. Oh, yikes. Looks like someone doesn't understand physics, do they? Well, I just explained the law of thermodynamics that you're referring to, the first law of thermodynamics, and it's inapplicable to human beings in terms of energy balance. Really, what we should say is mass balance, because we don't store energy on our bodies, we store mass, okay? Amino acids are mass. Fatty acids are mass, not calories. Calories are the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water around a closed thermodynamic system, also known as a bomb calorimeter, by one degree Celsius. It's a measurement of kinetic activity, or the movement of molecules within that water. That movement being caused 
caused by photons of a certain wavelength interacting with the surrounding water after being released from the rapid combustion of a food in said bomb calorimeter via a massive electrical current, thus causing rotations, vibrations, and translations. That is all they are. So to be informal, we say they're units of heat energy. And the thing about the human body is that it absorbs mass, not energy, in the forms of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and alcohol. Chemically interacts those substances under control with molecular oxygen. They react in such a way so as to change the chemical bonds. And in so doing, since those chemical reactions are exothermic, they do release energy in the form of calories, some of which is released to entropy, which is why we have body heat, the majority of which is actually encapsulated by ADP and PI, whether that be through substrate level phosphorylation that occurs in the Krebs cycle or through oxidative phosphorylation to form ATP, the cellular energy currency or the molecular energy storage form of the body. And then when that energy needs to be released to carry out other metabolic processes, it will be hydrolyzed into ADP and PI again. And in some rare circumstances, AMP and pyrophosphate. Everything remains mass effectively. Calories are a metabolic byproduct. You're not storing calories. The amount of chemical reactions that are occurring that I was just referring to is dictated by your hormones and your hormonal responses are dictated by the food you eat, the types of food, the macronutrient makeup, carbohydrates, fatty acids, amino acids, so protein, fat, and sugars. We're done here. Body composition is a mass balance exercise. Mass in, mass out, not energy in, energy out. So calories in, calories out can go f*** itself, okay? Oh, okay, so that was your video. That was your video. So let's look at the caption. Calories in versus calories out is old school thinking. Get with the times. It's not old school thinking, actually. I do think people should get with the times. Not really the times. Get with the science. But no. Congratulations, the award for the most ironic statement by a personal trainer today. The award has found a winner. Yes, it has. And it's in this f***ing video. And it's not her. It's you. There were other moronic statements listed from her. Sure. Honestly, it's 2024 and people are saying thermodynamics is old school. No, no, no. She didn't say thermodynamics is old school. Thermodynamics is a fact of reality, actually. You just don't know how how to interpret it. No, it's basic level one science, which has been proven over and over for decades in endless research. Okay, so this statement, which has been proven in research, a five-year-old can say that statement. It's been proven by research. I think of people giving the fluoride stare when they say that sentence. It's been proven by, by research. That doesn't mean anything. Those are words. Do you know how to interpret research? You probably don't. You know what actually is old school thinking? Thinking that walking slowly on a treadmill with an incline is superior for fat loss. Literally what the old 70 year old bodybuilders would teach me when I was a teenager in the gym. People, fat as a fuel source does not instantly mean superior body fat loss. So technically correct. However, if your body is more adept at utilizing fatty acids in the mitochondria through beta oxidation and using things like the catabolism of triglycerides in adipocytes and also muscle cells into glycerol and fatty acids, acids, the former of which is then used to produce more glucose since you're not eating it, that's an auspicious approach to actually losing body fat because the body has to get the energy from somewhere. It's using more fat, which is most easily achieved and derived from stored fat on the body, and it's also using the breaking apart of triglycerides, stored fat on your body, for glucose production. So... Okay, anyway. So yes, you are correct. Low intensity aerobic work will use your fats as fuel preferentially. And once again, for any viewers wondering, refer to the video in the upper right hand corner of the screen where I covered this. That is not necessarily the case. That is not how that works, okay? It uses carbohydrates in the mitochondria if you are someone that is more adept at using carbohydrates because you have eaten carbohydrates for your entire life. And it uses more fatty acids in the mitochondria for ATP production to resynthesize glycogen for working out. If those people that depend on glucose have gone a few hours without eating, or if you are in a ketogenic state, that also has to do with the Randall cycle. The body will continue to utilize for fuel what it is most familiar with utilizing until something very significant perturbs that equilibrium, like a massive amount of glucose in a cell. What I'm saying is that it can use both. Depends on the context. It's not necessarily the case that your body will use more fat for fuel in aerobic exercise. But guess what? This does not mean more body fat loss. We know this. It's been shown over and over again. Okay, so it's been shown over and over again. It's been shown over and over again. It's been shown over and over again. Okay, so we know that engaging in aerobic exercise will not guarantee fat loss. We know that. We're talking from a biochemical perspective here, what's going on. The fuel source you use for a few minutes of cardio in your day does not equal superior fat loss. Correct. In fact, any cardio at all, anything colloquially deemed cardio, is conducive to actually effectuating inappropriate hypertrophy of the heart muscle, so it's damaging to the heart, contrary to popular belief. And it's also conducive to raising cortisol chronically, which will waste muscle and will also increase fat storage because cortisol is a hormone responsible for creating glucose. 
And when there's excess glucose in the bloodstream that isn't being used, well, guess what happens? It's transmuted into fatty acids, joined with another glycerol molecule, creating triglycerides, and stored in adipocytes, fat cells, or your muscle cells. It doesn't matter. Fat storage. The old school thing of calories in versus calories out is always the driver of fat loss. No, it's not. And I covered that. Mark. Regardless of using high intensity work, which will be more glycolytic, which means using carbohydrates as fuel, preferentially. No. False. You are creating more glucose for glycogen resynthesis, but in a ketogenic state, what does the body use to create glucose? Oh yeah, it uses triglycerides. It catabolizes triglycerides into individual fatty acids and glycerol molecules. The latter is used through gluconeogenesis in the liver primarily to create glucose, which is administered into the bloodstream for any muscle cell that is in need of glycogen resynthesis to sequester that glucose. And the fatty acids that were released from the triglyceride molecule are carried by albumin in blood plasma and taken into a cell and oxidized through oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria for ATP production. Okay? Just because something is more glycolytic doesn't mean that you're not going to be oxidizing more fat and you're going to be burning more carbohydrates because you're using glycogen. It's misleading. And it's important that we say this. This isn't just me being trivially captious and pedantic. It's important because when you say things like that, that leads people to believe that them weightlifting is not helping them burn fat. Yes, it is. Anyway, or low intensity using fat as fuel plays no significant role in superior fat loss. <sighs> covered that. It's like the keto people. What about the keto people? Keto burns more fat. It does if you do it properly. Yes. Yeah, because when you do keto, you eat more fat. Yeah. So your main energy intake is fat. Yeah. Therefore, you burn more fat as fuel. Yeah. Since it's what's available. Yep. This does not mean more fat loss than someone doing high carbs and low fat with the same amount of calories in a deficit. Yes, it usually does, actually. Yes, it does. And I already covered that. I love repeating myself. Not. Trainers love misleading content. Oh, the projection. How true this statement is, Mark. Purposely making out walking on a treadmill is superior for actual body fat loss is incorrect. Well... <laughs> That's your opinion. And then saying cows in versus cows out is old school is just plain horrendous covered that. Do which cardio you prefer. No, neither is superior for actual body fat loss. Okay, that's not true. And I already covered why that's not true. However, anaerobic exercise is actually much more indicated for human physiology in many respects, not just for fat loss. It makes you stronger. It increases your basal metabolic rate at rest because of the increased blood supply and nutrient supply that is imposed by increased muscle mass on the body. It makes your muscle cells more responsive, fast twitch. You can actually change muscle fibers to be slow twitch from fast twitch and fast twitch from slow twitch if you just impose the right training. And also makes you look better, by the way, but it does increase fat loss because of the increased basal metabolic rate, and also the amount of fat that you are using when you are exercising in a ketogenic state. Because you're not consuming glucose, that requires the body to break down something for glucose, and usually it breaks down your stored fat, like I just elucidated. And also, if you're a ketogenic, your mitochondria use more fat, and so they are engaging in beta oxidation more, and so that also imposes a demand by the body to get their fat from somewhere. So if you are typically fasted one meal a day type of person, it will also break down triglycerides, your stored fat for doing such a thing to provide the body with fatty acids for that. And then of course the liver will produce ketones as a result of that beta oxidation. And so you are oxidizing ketones and you are oxidizing fatty acids in the mitochondria and you are using glycerol from triglycerides in the liver to produce glucose. All of those things come from triglycerides, which is the form of fat stored on your body, whether it be in adipocytes, fat cells, or whether it be in muscle cells. So with that being said, Coach Mark, you have made a fool of yourself here today and you have displayed an arrogant ignorance that is, well, extremely endemic in this space, unfortunately. And you were put right where you are absolutely wrong. So, with that being said, if you enjoyed the video and learned something, please leave a like, please subscribe to the channel, and please leave your thoughts in the comment section below. And also, by my book, Contraindicated, a closer look and revision of mainstream health axioms that have perpetuated illness, disorder, and disease for over a century, if you haven't already. And also, once again, subscribe to the Patreon, if you haven't already. Links to both of those things in the description below. And also, most importantly, the link in the bottom of the screen Screen. That's a rule link. That is a link to a fantastic site by a fantastic company with fantastic products. The flagship product being Stem Enhance Ultra, a product that I recommend everyone take if they're older than the age of 18 because there's no reason why they shouldn't be. And if you want to learn more about those products, which I recommend you do before you start buying something impetuously, go ahead and refer to the link in the top right corner of the screen, the Cerule Products link, which is a complete elucidation and explanation of what those products are, who should take them, why you should take them, when to take them, etc, etc. And also I would migrate to the description below and find 
find a video that was done between myself and Professor Bart K on these products in further detail, as well as the company of Cerule itself. Also, email me at edgoki14 at gmail.com if you have any questions regarding anything at all, such as, oh, I don't know, how to receive the Cerule products for free, because who in the right mind wouldn't want that? And with that being said, join me next time when we react to someone else, like a personal trainer, who thinks they know something about something because they know the word thermodynamics. So, till then.